Hello and a warm welcome to the second instalment in our Stories from the Strong Room series. 2021 marks the 85th anniversary since Winifred Holtby's most famous novel, South Riding, was published. And in this video, we'll explore some of the real life inspirations behind the location, themes and characters created by Winifred Holtby. However, if you haven't already, be sure to check out the previous video on Winifred Hoppy herself, which will give you an overview of her life and an insight into the fascinating woman behind South Riding. And of course, remember to subscribe to our channel and click that little bell icon to make sure you're notified every time we upload a new video. Okay, so to very briefly recap, we're going to fast forward to the end of Winifred's life when she begins writing her final novel. In spring 1932, Winifred was diagnosed with Bright's disease and given just two years to live. Her final years became a frenzy of work, continuing with her journalism, completing and publishing two books, but now knowing her time was limited, Winifred put a great deal of her efforts into what was to become her crowning glory, South Riding. Her final novel was completed just one month before her death at the age of 37. During the last few months of Winifred's life, she helped her friend Vera Britton by taking care of her young children while Vera herself was coping with her husband's serious illness and her own father's suicide. After Winifred's death, Vera was determined to make amends by ensuring as Winifred's literary executor that her final and most significant work saw the light of day. South Riding was published on the 2nd of March 1936, just six months after Winifred's death and it hasn't been out of print since. Here is Winifred's original manuscript of South Riding, which is part of our Winifred Holtby collection here at the Hull History Centre. And it is a truly marvellous thing to behold. Written in her own hand, along with her crossings out, it shows her editorial decisions to change words and the order of sentences, and provides some sense of her writing process. South Riding was born of two powerful factors in Winifred's life her deep roots in the Yorkshire countryside, and her fascination with the comedies and tragedies of local government. In many ways, it's a story of the confrontation between the old ways of farming, which was governed by the territorial and family loyalties, as well as the weather, of course, and the advocates for progress and radical change. Through the novel's pages, a rural community struggle against the hardship of the 1930s economic depression brings to life the people and places Winifred had known best, in the Yorkshire worlds of her childhood. Her novel is steeped in the traditions of Yorkshire, the stoicism and humour of its people and the majesty of its landscape. Long before she began writing South Riding, Winifred had wanted to return to her roots and write another Yorkshire story. Indeed, she never lost this strong pull to her origins. In a letter to the South African novelist Sarah Gertrude Millen, she wrote that had it not been for a sympathetic schoolmistress persuading her parents to send her to college, she would have never left the farm environment of animals, seasons, shooting parties, the visits of foremen and pig dealers, the calls of millers and their wives. Even now, she added, quite half my life is there and all my roots. However, for Winifred, her novel did not materialise easily to begin with. In a letter to another friend, St John Irvine, she discussed the difficulties she faced in researching her novel and putting pen to paper, claiming she had made false start after false start, feeling unable to work until I get better into the atmosphere of the agricultural slump. It's awful what is happening in the East Riding, and I don't tackle it till I am certain that I understand just what I am doing and can be just and real. Owing to her journalistic credentials and her strong desire to document life in the East Riding, South Riding feels authentic and is certainly far from an idealised fantasy. Winifred often featured the areas she knew really well in her novels. Rudston and the worlds of the East Riding is depicted in Anderby World. Cottingham, a suburb of Hull, is portrayed in the crowded street, and the Dales country where her mother was born is represented in the land of Green Ginger. In her final novel, Winifred used the landscape of the real East Riding as a blueprint for her fictional South Riding. It was an area she knew intimately, and the location depicted in South Riding feels real, just as it would have been in the 1930s, and remains recognisable today. Here, Winifred's map, drawn in her own hand, signifies the extent to which reality inspired her fiction. 
Winifred's South Riding lies on the north bank of the Great Gleam Estuary, and at the heart of the estuary is the city of Kingsport, instantly recognisable as Kingston upon Hull. And there are numerous equivalences throughout the novel, including the county town of Flintonbridge representing Beverly, Sunk Island inspired the ex servicemen's colony at Cold Harbour, Robert Kahn's decaying Maythorpe Hall was inspired by the White Hall at Winestead, which Winifred most probably observed as a passenger on the Hull to Withensee Railway, and the centre for much of the story, the seaside town of Kiplington, where Sarah Burton has been appointed as headmistress of the girls' school, is an amalgamation of Hornsey and Withensee, both of which just happened to be where Winifred lodged while writing the book. South Riding is a character-driven book, with fully formed and memorable characters, all with the complexities and foibles of real people. Now, sadly, we don't have time to explore in depth the inspiration behind the many, many characters created by Winifred, like her uncle, whose situation has been likened to that of character Robert Kahn. His wife, suffering with poor mental health, had been sent to an expensive asylum, and to cover the costs, he sold his horses. Or that the lost home comforts of Councillor Huggins was inspired by the troubles of a Yorkshire shopkeeper who wept because his wife had refused to sleep with him since the birth of their eight-year-old son. No, we don't have time for all that here, but we will briefly consider the real-life inspirations behind the two main female characters, Mrs Beddoes and Sarah Burton, shortly. Indeed, there are a lot of characters. If you happen to pick up a copy of South Riding, you'll notice towards the start of the book a character list spanning the better part of five pages. Winifred's novel includes over 160 characters, which is akin to a Russian doorstopper. Albeit some of those characters are only marginally referenced, yet all feel necessary in order to provide a panoramic view of Yorkshire life and build a real sense of a community and the everyday lives of the people that live there. Humanity is at this novel's heart, with all of its struggles, triumphs, capabilities and limitations. Winifred writes in the prefatory letter to the novel, We are not only single individuals, each face to face with eternity and our separate spirits. We are members one of another. A poignant thought when you realise Winifred was writing with the knowledge of her imminent death. And it feels particularly poignant today, in this time of pandemic. In South Riding, the drama of English local government takes centre stage. Winifred takes the mundane workings of local government, much of which was sourced from her mother's waste paper basket by secretly removing discarded council minutes and official documents to help plot her story, and somehow, through her humorous and memorable characterisation, makes it entertaining. Winifred calls local government the community's first line of defence against their common enemies of poverty, sickness, ignorance, isolation, etc. Essentially, through her novel, Winifred shows how public decisions shape the life of the individual, and between its pages, South Riding deals with a huge range of social issues, including, but far from limited to, the value of education, unemployment, local building programmes, poor relief and the treatment of people living with mental illness. The bureaucracy of local government is conveyed as both a catalyst for social improvement, of which Winifred herself was an advocate, as well as a vehicle for abuse and corruption in the wrong hands. And she does this best through the characters of Alderman Snaith and Councillor Huggins, who conspire to make sure the construction of a new housing development will result in their personal financial gain. The basis of this scandal was inspired by Winifred's attendance at a public inquiry in 1932 in Hull, which found a long-serving Conservative member of the council guilty of making profits from land sales. Winifred fashioned aspects of her character's physical appearances and personalities from people that she had come across in her life. The character Mrs Beddoes is the South Riding's first female alderman, a formidable and vocal presence on the council, a wise grandmother figure she finds happiness through community contribution and through her friendship with squire and councillor Robert Kahn. Mrs Beddoes is most clearly influenced by Winifred's own mother, Alice Holtby, the first woman to become alderman of the East Riding County Council. Alice opposed the publication of South Riding, concerned that it was all too clearly inspired by her own life and that of her family. 
She became Vera Britton's primary obstacle when it came to publishing the book. She was particularly concerned that her daughter's satirical depiction of local government would expose her own job to criticism and ridicule. After its publication, Alice commented in a letter to a friend that she considered Winifred's illness to blame for her writing South Riding in such a libelous manner. Although Winifred tried to allay her mother's fears in the prefatory letter addressed to her at the beginning of the novel, in which she states, Alderman Mrs. Beddoes is not Alderman Mrs. Holtby, while admitting that she had borrowed a few of her mother's sayings from her racy tongue, it was not enough to dispel her mother's fears, and upon the book's publication, Alice retired as Alderman on the East Riding County Council. Sarah Burton is an idealistic headmistress who returns from London to her place of birth, the South Riding, full of determination to make a difference and implement change. Although Winifred made her heroine small and red-haired, resembling her friend and colleague at Time and Tide, Labour MP Ellen Wilkinson, Sarah Burton's personality most closely resembles Winifred herself. She is the book's chief advocate for social change, and Winifred's voice is most clearly heard when she defends the right of single women to lead meaningful, independent lives. I was born to be a spinster, and by God I'm going to spin. It is through chance that Sarah Burton falls in love with the big, heavy, handsome, unhappy-looking man, Robert Kahn. Sarah Burton, like Winifred, is progressive and optimistically believes in the power of collective action by local government. In direct contrast, Robert Kahn's character is a symbolic figure of reaction who opposes the expansion of local government and the widespread benefits it would bring, and together they embody the old and new worlds. Though their love story is not that of Winifred Holtby and Harry Pearson, Vera Britton has suggested it contains the same elements of frustration and loss that Winifred experienced. The same conviction that even the pain of being left unsatisfied may be turned by those who will learn from it into the beginning of wisdom. The characters of Sarah Burton and Councillor Khan are often seen as the two main leads, so much so that Winifred's original suggestions for the title of her book included Councillor Khan of Maythorpe or The Teacher and the Alderman. It wasn't until April 1934, while residing in Withensey, that she came up with South Riding, thinking it a pretty name and ambiguous and rather romantic. South Riding is perhaps most clearly autobiographical in its attitude towards suffering and death. The knowledge, the fear, the grief Winifred withheld from her friends, she included in the personalities of her fictional world. Though South Riding is on the whole a positive and hopeful book, far from morbid but often filled with satiric humour, several of its leading characters face disease and premature death alone. Robert Kahn ceaselessly dreads a fatal attack of angina. Lily Sorden, the innkeeper's wife, has cancer and hides her painful suffering from her husband. Joe Astle, the socialist counsellor, sees his work for humanity doomed by tuberculosis and the fear of death in childbirth hangs over Mrs Holly. In the last few weeks of Winifred's life, she wrote the epilogue to South Riding, and through the eyes of Sarah Burton, who had just escaped death in an aeroplane accident, she faces the truth of death. She had been shaken out of sorrow. She had looked into the clear face of death and known her lover. She would fear no longer. She would live out her time and finish the task before her, because she knew that even the burden of living was not endless. Comforted by death, she faced the future. Upon its publication in March 1936, South Riding received considerable praise. One reviewer called it the most public-spirited novel of her generation, a book you can walk about in. Many of her readers, not realising that the word riding comes from the Saxon word thriding, which means the third part, began to ask why the county of Yorkshire was made up of north, west and east ridings without a south. South Riding was the choice of the English Book Society in the month of its publication. Edinburgh University awarded South Riding its annual James Tate Black Memorial Prize for the best novel of 1936. And soon after, the screen producer Victor Saville bought the film rights and it was released in cinemas in 1938. It has since been adapted as a radio play and two television series were broadcast in 1974 and most recently in 2011 
with the role of Sarah Burton, played by Anna Maxwell Martin, who grew up in Beverly in East Yorkshire. Throughout her professional life, Winifred could never quite make up her mind as to whether she was a reformer sort of person or a writer sort of person. And in writing South Riding, she was able to strike a balance between her reformist activity and her creativity. I hope this has inspired you to read this wonderful novel. Or if you've already read South Riding, perhaps you'll wish to return for a wander around Winifred's fictional world. Why not borrow a copy, support your local library and save a few pennies in the process? Thank you for listening and we look forward to welcoming you back next time.